Hello, everyone out there in Birdland. It's time for another episode of the podcast that's a blast. Out there with the birds with Ben Listas and Bill Thompson III. These two guys just love to talk, mostly about birds and birding. Out There with the Birds is supported by the Reader Rendezvous Birding Adventures from Birdwatcher's Digest. Come birding with us in our favorite places. Learn more at birdwatchersdigest.com backslash rr. Now, without any further ado, here they are, Bill and Ben. All right, welcome back. Ben, where's this? My buddy is. How's, how's everything up in the Northland? You know, things are going all right here up in the Northland, Bill. We've got snow right now, but typical, I think, this time of year. Um, temperatures in the 40s and getting rainy now coming up uh, this weekend. So it's really not until January, I think, when we get to the the real good stuff, the consistent temperatures in the teens and the snow that sticks around. But, you know, can't complain. So we're approaching the holidays here. I think it's going to be a white Christmas up here in Wisconsin. Yeah, good. We're going to have a great Christmas here in Ohio, as <laughs> usual. It's, yeah. uh, we've had a few dustings of snow, but they, they never stick around long. And we, we usually don't get our truly nasty or, depending on how you look at it, you know, wintry weather until February and March. And then we get yeah. hammered, and then you know when when nobody wants it anymore. Mm-hmm. <laughs> anyway, um, all right, what you got on the lineup this week? This is episode number three, by the way. We've made it to, uh, you know, a third of the way to double figures. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm excited about that, and um, I, yeah, I've been kind of scouring the uh, the bird related news items, and I've got things that relate to how we rethink species diversity. Okay. I've got big birds and the health of tropical forests, and I'm not talking about that big yellow one on Sesame Street either. Um, and then I've got being a middle school birding rock star in the lineup here. So Very that's cool. kind of three things that are on my mind. How about you? I've got duck stamp on my mind. I want to talk about duck stamps for people, mm-hmm. uh, for bird watchers. Um, the Super Bowl of birding, an event oh. I've never participated in, but I've always wanted to. Um that's up in uh, Massachusetts, coming up at the end of January. I uh, want to talk about the Space Coast Birding Festival, an event that is near and dear to our hearts. Looking One forward of, to that, yeah. And then I'm, I'll, I'll t- talk about the song in my head, the, the, the music I'm listening to right now. All right. Well, you got four and I got three, so I think you're going first. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, uh, I'm a firm believer, even though I'm not – uh, um, a hunter. Uh, I, I, I grew up learning how to shoot, mostly at you know beer cans and pop cans and stuff like that. My dad, and uh, uh, it's important that birders and hunters often think like they're polar opposites, but actually we share a lot in common. In fact, it's a pretty well documented fact that our national wildlife refuge system and many of our preserved, especially wetland areas up in the uh, prairie and pothole region of the upper Midwest have been set aside, preserved, maintained through dollars um, that were generated from the sale of duck stamps. And uh, duck stamps was actually the full name is the Migratory Bird Hunting and Conservation Stamp, but everybody calls it the duck stamp. It's uh, basically a hunting permit that duck hunters have to buy if they're going to be hunting on federal land. And I was just this morning over at the Ohio River Islands National Wildlife Refuge talking to Rebecca Young, the refuge manager there, and she said they sell oh probably 50 to 100 duck stamps a year, almost all to hunters along the Ohio River, but increasingly, she said, they're selling to birders. And the reason I want to encourage listeners, and we've done this in Birdwatcher's Digest over the years, encouraging birdwatchers to buy stamps, is that the stamps not only support habitat acquisition um, for waterfowl and all a lot of other birds that benefit from that, like, you know, rails and and uh, uh, wading birds and all the warblers and everything that lives around yeah. these. Habitat that always benefits all the right. critters. Right, right. But it's also a great way to pay it forward. You know, bird watchers, you can, if you buy a duck stamp, you can get in free to a lot of national wildlife refuges, which is great. But it's just a great thing to do um, to uh, buy a duck stamp every year. They, the new one comes out in June. I'm looking at the new design for the 2017-18 stamp, and it's Canada geese painted by James Houtman, one of the three Houtman brothers that have formed the duck stamp dynasty. Um, <laughs> Do they have big long beards? Oh my God. They wear sunglasses all the time. No, that's not, that's, this is duck stamp dynasty, not duck <laughs> dynasty. That's, these guys are uh, normal guys. They're fantastically talented artists, Robert, James, and Joseph, and they've all won multiple duck stamps. They live up in uh, Minnesota, I believe. So, but 25 bucks at your local post office or at your local National Wildlife Refuge, or I know the American Birding Association sells them too. A lot of nature centers sell them. 25 bucks, 
and you are paying it forward as a bird watcher. And any hunter that says, well, we hunters pay our way and you bird watchers never do, you can hold up your duck stamp, which I always affix to my binoculars and say, mm -hmm. actually, yep. I'm, I bought a duck stamp just like you. The difference is I'm not taking any ducks out. Don't know whether you are or not. <laughs> Depends on your <laughs> skills, hunter. But anyway, I just think that's a cool thing to do. And uh, well, duck I, stamps are a neat thing. One of the cool things about it is it, it, it's a mechanism that allows birders to – you, to, to contribute where you know birding being non-consumptive unlike hunting there isn't this licensing channel to go through to collect right. funds from the users right. so it's a nice way of birders being able to have a voice like you said kind of being able to hold up our hands and and say hey I'm, I'm pulling my weight on this too and i think that was really one of the um driving motivators for the american birding association to start selling duck stamps mm -hmm. because they could kind of look at their numbers of duck stamp sales and unlike the wildlife refuge which is you know a large part hunters buying them some part birders the aba can hold up their hands and say look how much birders believe right. in duck stamps because right. you know, the assumption is if someone's buying a duck stamp from the aba they're doing it as kind of with their bird or hat on that's and right certainly um i think too there'd be a number of bird watchers who are perhaps also waterfowl hunters, actually. Yeah, and I know a lot of duck hunters that are friends of mine that have always asked me bird questions, and these guys really, really know their birds typically. You have to, to be a hunter, because you got a few seconds to make a decision on whether that's the species that you're allowed to hunt or not. Mm -hmm. So I've got a lot of respect for it. I'm I'm not, uh, haven't been a hunter myself. I know how to shoot. I've had to, you know, put a few rabbit animals down on my farm over the years, but um, it's, it's just a nice thing to proudly wear that duck stamp on your binoculars and um when you if you're anybody listening goes out and buys a duck stamp at their local post office or wildlife refuge or anything make sure you fill out the form there's usually a questionnaire that comes with it make sure that you say that you're a bird watcher or a birder on that form because the the federal government tallies those numbers up and growing numbers of birders are buying duck stamps and we want every one of those to be counted so that's it yep. on the duck stamp well you know my first uh bullet point here what I want to talk about is a um, study that was recently done by the American Museum of Natural History and uh, some folks there were studying uh, diversity of bird species and um, came up with a calculation that the number of bird species glo globally could potentially be double of what we think it is right now so going from nine to ten thousand to eighteen thousand different bird species wow. and of course this isn't one of those things where they're discovering new critters, you know, by the boatloads. It, it has to do with kind of what we call a species and, right. and this concept of hidden diversity. You know, as, as birders, we see that when um, a species might get split, for instance, right. you know, we call this one species, not two species. And what I thought this was really interesting about this is this concept of what is a species. And it seems as though, and I'm not a scientist, you know, I, I, I enjoy birds. I, I studied biology a bit in, um, in college, but I wouldn't call myself a scientist, but this it seems as though there's not necessarily a consensus about what a species is. There's this biological species concept, which is where we get the nine to ten thousand number. You know, this is um, a species defined as groups that can inter, you know, individuals that interbreed with one another. Right. And then there is an emerging school of thought that says species diversity could be tabulated based on. Morpholo morphology or physical character characteristics of spe of um, individuals that might kind of lead to evolution, whether it's beak size or shape or some of these uh, physical characteristics that you could say, even though those two animals over there can breed together, they're two different species because they're on two divergent evolutionary paths. So it, it's it's kind of interesting to think about it, and of course, as birders. You know, we we tend to be kind of numbers oriented people for listers, anyways. Right. So it's it's there's this like you know scientific discussion about what's a species, and then of course there's the birders who are I, I don't know. I mean, what do you think about when you get a new um, bird on your life list because a species has been split, or conversely when you get one taken away when it's been lumped? Do you, you pay much attention to things like that? I mean, not a ton. I, you know, I I'm somewhere uh, in the I guess I can't remember. I think I'm in the in the high 500s, uh, getting ready to get 600 species, I believe. Mm -hmm. I think that's right. I, but that's how little I care about it. I mean, I, yeah. I, I love getting a new species. Um, do I jump for joy that I can now count Pacific Wren? Um, <laughs> no. I mean, yeah. I 
I'm sure I haven't even looked that up in my book and marked it. I, you know, I've got a, a, a checklist that I keep in a, in a physical book and, um, you know, I, no, I, I, I don't really care about it. I'm, I'm interested. I, I mean, I, it's interesting. They're thinking about splitting a bunch of song sparrows and a bunch of Fox sparrows and a bunch of red cross bills. And you know, I think that's interesting and I applaud the science that's doing it, but you know, I've been a bird watcher long enough to have seen, you know, Northern flicker, Baltimore or slash Northern Oriole, uh, you know, Eastern towie, all these things lumped and names changed and things like that. And the pendulum swings back and forth on the smaller scale. I think what you're talking about could be massively uh, disrupting to <laughs> to people to yeah, people who are serious listers and, and yeah. really take it, you know, to the and, and from the scientific community, which um, which is kind of the origin of this article that I got here. Of course, they're not so much um, people who are listing as a hobby or recreational take on 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 this um, information here, but you know, it's. The, these people are talking about with this increased recognition of diversity and with biodiversity being something prized as a target for conservation, it could increase the awareness or the need or the drive to conserve right. species and habitat more. And of course, I'm instantly thinking to myself, it seems to me that we have enough reasons right now as it is with these 10,000 bird species globally to start conserving them as best we can. Um, I don't know that people are going to necessarily feel like we need to try harder if they push it up to 18,000. Yeah, that could present some real confusion and probably some pushback from people who don't want there to be that many species because, you know, anytime there's been an endangered species or a threat of a, a species being declared endangered, people who own land where those species occur often, you know, have a, a go into an uproar. Because yeah. they don't want their land to be, you know. So I don't know. Yeah. I, Science I, is fascinating that way, though. Oh, you for know, sure. This kind of cutting edge, uh, thinking about how humans interact and, and measure mm -hmm. and um, evaluate the natural things around us. Right. right. And speaking of of natural things around us, you know, one of the natural things to do in in late winter is watch the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. um, not everybody's not everybody's cup of tea. Um, many I'm of us. A football fan. I like the Super Bowl. Yeah, I, I mean it's a spectacle. Many of us yeah. like to watch it for the commercials, because yeah. um, <laughs> the game's often less interesting than the commercials. <laughs> but uh, the, the Super Bowl I want to talk about today is the Super Bowl of Birding, and that's a an event that folks at Mass Audubon started some years ago. I believe Wayne Peterson might have been one of the folks involved in it, and it's centered at the Joppa Flats um, Education Center out on. Um, the Massachusetts coast. And they started this thing. I think it's been going for a bunch of years. Um, it's January 28th this year, 2017 or ne next year. And uh, it's, it's basically a big day in Northeastern Massachusetts and Southeastern New Hampshire. And it's every, you know, the teams that they're, they're a bunch of prize categories for, for teams with the most species for teams with the, the most points because you get points for every species. So a team might win the, the highest species count, but they might not be the team that wins the biggest number of points. A rare bird gets you five points. A less rare bird gets you fewer. I like that concept. Yeah. So there are a whole bunch of different, really interesting, um, really interesting awards, including awards for brand new birders and for young birders and stuff like that. So it's an event I've never been able to do because I've usually been either at Space Coast or at the SHOT Show or something like that. But it's one I would really like to do sometime. However, the one thing that it's clear, if you think about it, the Massachusetts coast in late January, it's not where you're going to go to work on your suntan. You, gotta, <laughs> you talk about layering, man. You've got to have <laughs> multiple down coats and, uh, and, you know, hand warmers and all that stuff. But I mean, they see cool birds and it's something I would like to, I would like to participate in sometime. And they got some pretty funny, uh, names for the, uh, some of the teams, like there was a, um, <laughs> the blue gray pass catchers. And they... <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, what, 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 you know, one of the things that I, I really like about this concept, it's, it's different than your traditional big day competition that there's a point gradation or, or species are different or weighted differently based yep. on rarity. Yeah. Um, which is, you, you know, as birders, we always think, well, uh, a pileated woodpecker is, you know, rated a little bit more than say a house sparrow. Right. Exactly. You, you know, and, and to, to be, <laughs> to see a birding event like this where, oh yeah, you know, we think in these terms, but they've kind of, you know, measured it out. And that's, oh. that's pretty interesting. Um, the, 
you know, speaking of, of rare birds mm-hmm. and, and, and you wonder, you know, what would you get for a, a, a first state record at yeah. an event like this? Now, have you ever, and I believe you have, I believe the answer is yes. Have you ever had found a first state record for Ohio? Uh, I've found a first state record for Ohio and for West Virginia, neither of which has been accepted. Uh, the Ohio one is still pending. That's that Pacific Slope flycatcher that I had last year in my backyard. The other one was um, I found with Julie and ba- little baby Phoebe when she was still uh, nursing. Um, we found the first state record for Little Gull for West Virginia, but because we only had two and a half observers, it was not accepted by the records committee. Um, hey, but before we go on to a rare bird, I want to say if anybody wants information on that Super Bowl of birding, they can go to massaudubon.org and it'll it's right there on their homepage. So, okay. um, and and I want to a couple of the other team names: the Bella Chuckers, obviously for Bill Belichuck, <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. and, and the uh, New Hampshire Fourth and Long Spurs, which <laughs> 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 keeping the football theme going there. I love it. So maybe one year you and I can take the podcast on the road and go up there and do the Super Bowl of birding. I love that idea. Back to you. Yeah. So 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 um you know obviously finding a first state record bird mm-hmm. huge um, as as a bird watcher I can't imagine there are there has got to be a feather in your cap uh, and in Colorado recently there were two 13 year old twins that um, found a purple sandpiper first state record ever in Colorado Whoa. two 13 year old birders can you imagine the excitement being a 13 year old birder all of a sudden becoming a birder rock star yeah. in the state of Colorado for finding the state's first purple sandpiper. This happened on the Dillon Reservoir. These were, um, I believe these kids were from uh, Bo- the Boulder area, uh, you know, just uh, looking for a cackling goose at this reservoir after a, you know, day of snowboarding or something on the slopes. And all of a sudden they see a, a bird that, you know, is that a willet? Is that a rock sandpiper? And, and they kind of figured out that's a purple sandpiper, but uh Man, I can't imagine something as thrilling as that. I've never, I mean, found a, a first state record or anything. That's something that does, just doesn't happen too often. You've got potentially two of them if you got those records accepted. Well, I don't know. Yeah, I think I know the West the... Virginia one is uh, maybe not – I wouldn't hold out hope on that one. But no, uh, not, pretty exciting. Not accepted and not uh, – n- you know, never going to get accepted even though – because you just there, there, there are rules to finding these things. You have to have either a – either a um, uh, you know, documented photo or video, or you have to have a, sa- you know, the, the, the specimen of the bird, like yeah. the, the Ohio's first uh, uh, Eurasian collar dove was found because a, a hunter shot this dove and realized it wasn't something he should have shot. He was morning dove hunting and he threw it into the weeds and then went back and his friend said, you know, that might be some rare bird. You might want to report that. And, he, and the guy didn't want to get in trouble. Yeah. By the time he went back to get it a couple of days later, there was just a wing and part of the body left because animals had been at it. And he turned it in and that was the first state record of, uh, Eurasian collar dove, not the Eurasian collar dove that flew by our tower uh, that Julie saw, you know, uh, some years ago, 10 years ago or whatever, yeah. and did a painting of. You got to have either three observers, uh, video evidence, um, photo evidence or some, you know. Yeah. So and my our sightings, those two sightings didn't qualify. My, my Pacific Slope flycatcher is a little bit of a conundrum because that bird, as you know, it can only be identified mm-hmm. by DNA or in some cases by call that my bird responded to Pacific Slope flycatcher playback, not to Cordilleran flycatcher playback. And those two birds have been split to refer, refer back to your original topic yeah. from what was originally the uh, Western flycatcher. So I'm waiting to hear from the Ohio birds records committee and we'll see. Well, it's cool for the, the this, these 13 year old uh, brothers that the birds stuck around well photo documented you know, yeah. photographers came in and they, and they got, you know, high fives, great recognitions of the, the Boulder Christmas bird count. I guess they were just the, uh, the stars of the show there for That's finding so cool. that bird. So yeah, memorable moment for those kids. I'm sure it's, uh, it, you know, they're already hardcore birds at 13 years old. If they're getting done with a day of skiing, going out <laughs> to see if they can get cackling goose for the year list. But, uh, right. if that wasn't enough, uh, I'm sure this cemented birding as uh, something they're sticking with. Yeah. We need more of that. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, uh, speaking of uh, awesome birding, the Space Coast Birding and Wildlife Festival is coming up January 25 and 30, and you and I will be there representing BirdWatch Love that event. And, yeah. and the Expo and, and other stuff. You've been going to that for a bunch of years, mm-hmm. um, but you'll be going in a different capacity this year. Is that going to feel weird for you? No, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I mean, there's nothing weird about going out and birding 
Merritt National Wildlife Refuge and, you know, going and seeing gannets and all the waterfowl and the spoonbills and the storks and just the the wonderful location that is for birding and of course the wonderful people there as yeah. well. The all all the birders coming together. I, I love being at birding festivals. It is such a great time just to be able to appreciate different places, but also really to hang with fellow birders. Yeah. So I can't wait to get there. It's going to be fun. And you, you won't have to sell binoculars this time, man. You know? No, no, I won't be selling binoculars. I will be talking to people about kind of the stuff we do, you know, yeah. the, the, uh, you know, connecting birders with, uh, with each other and, and, uh, you know, building a strong birding community. It's kind of what we're about. And, yeah. uh, that's, it's a, it's, <laughs> the perfect place to to meet people and uh, bring them in the fold. Well, our friends that that have, that started that uh, festival back in the day, uh, uh, Laura Lee Thompson and uh, uh, Nita Harris and um, the, the, the Barbara Holscher and, and Barbie Eager, the, the folks that run it now. It's been a, a, a dynamo festival, and it's one of those yeah. events that changed. It was originally in November, and they didn't want to overlap with a couple other big festivals, so they moved to January. They get the, the. I mean, I've never seen a birding festival that actually pays to have billboards up on I ninety five. Yeah, that, that's how big this one is, and they do a fantastic job with um, preserving habitat and getting young people involved. It's a great event, so I recommend people Google Space Coast Birding Festival if you want to get away to Florida for a little bit in late January. Phenomenal birding, super mm-hmm. easy, a million different field trips, doing all kinds of stuff, not just birds. It's a fantastic event, and Birdwatchers Digest, I believe, was a sponsor from the first year on. So we're yeah. we're, we're proud of our association with that, and and, and really applaud all the good work they do. You know, Florida is one of those places that just, if, if, if it left unchecked, there'd be, you know, strip malls and housing developments over every square inch. And what they've done there in Brevard County to set aside green space and be wise about their develop, development, I think is, is very, very impressive. Well, and, and kind of going back to the, the duck stamp conservation um, issue, the birding festival plays a huge role, I think, in the recognition of the powers that be down there, yeah. the value of preserving habitat, the value of having the refuge there. And of course, once again, birders just able to kind of uh, raise their hand or, or make their mark in, in saying that uh, we're advocates for conservation. We support it with not only our um, our dollars, but also our, our hard work and efforts. I mean, the, the work that Laura Lee and the, the folks that organize that event, tireless, um, the, the amount of work they, they put into it, and certainly uh, they get the results. So it's a fantastic event to be a part of. Plus there's rock shrimp at Dixie Crossroads. So. Here's that too. Here's <laughs> that too. <laughs> All right. What's your last thing, man? Yeah. So so um, this was an interesting little bit of news I was reading about the tropical uh, rainforest or tropical forest, essentially. In tropical forest, over 90% of the trees in tropical forest rely on fruit dispersal for regeneration, which is very different than North America here where we have wind you know, dispersal. We, in North America, up here in the north, it seems like there's a million ways of getting your genetic material out there if you're a tree. Right. 90% of the trees in the tropics require fruit dispersal. And do you know who does the heavy lifting on that? Large birds. This is a... Um, recent study done by the Senekberg Research Institute and Natural History Museum, um, essentially highlighting the pivotal role that large birds in particular play in moving tree fruits and dispersing them and establishing populations of, um, you know, these trees in in forests in, in this whole ecological web here. And, it, it, right. it goes to show the importance of some of these bigger birds, which are easier targets for predators, hunters. These are the species that, you know, these these big, physically bigger species are the ones that tend to get threatened more quick. They have uh, they have larger habitat requirements. So really shining a light on the need of protecting some of these uh, larger kind of keystone species with birds here. You know, we hear about it in um, out west in uh, the states here with, you know, protecting grizzly bear habitat with how much they roam. It just casts this large umbrella of habitat in general because there's this key keystone species with the grizzly bear. In the tropics, same type of thing. Large birds moving seeds, um, just critical about, like, for the like health of tropical forests. and stuff like that? What kind of species are you talking about? Well, you know, I'm guessing they're talking about um, toucans, that, that kind of thing. Um, Guans. Guans, exactly. Oh, sorry, yeah. 
yep, yep. So th- those types of birds, um, d- you know, and this this was done in the and. Uh, Andean forest in uh, Colombia okay. is where this study was done in particular. So, um, you well, know, I, I am so glad that we could not, that we did not have to get through an episode without some, even indirect reference to scatology. <laughs> I suppose seed to seed. Yeah, you know what? It's it it makes the world go round, doesn't it? You're, you you are Scatman Lizdis. <laughs> so you yeah, are. Let's just keep that between us. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so it's the song in my head, the music in my head right now. I've been listening. I'm. This is a throwback. I've been listening to "Time Out of Mind" by Bob Dylan. That's a great album. It's a great album. It's got a couple songs on there that are just such keepers. And you know that album even though it came out quite a while ago, it was produced by Daniel Lanois. And that was sort of a big comeback album for Dylan because his sound was big and it was kind of together. And mm-hmm. Dylan, Dylan was singing well and he had all these great instruments behind him. You know, there's pedal steel and there's dobro and all this stuff that Daniel Lanois brought into, into the, the arrangements, into the mix, into the recording. It's a fantastic it's like a album. album. Yeah, very much so. So I recommend that Time Out of Mind by the master, Bob Dylan. Yeah, he, you know, he, he, you never know. He, it's always kind of hit or miss with his um, more current stuff. But boy, that was a home run that album. I, um, I'm giving you 100 percent support on that recommendation. And if you listen carefully in these new digital, you know, versions that you get, and you listen with some good headphones, you can actually hear like they. This is one of Lanois's recording um, sort of hallmarks is that he keeps it pretty natural. He does a lot of it na- uh, live, so you can like hear guys like you know, dropping their picks and you can, you can, their fingers <laughs> sliding on the guitars, a lot of which in modern music, all that stuff is scrubbed out in the, in the, in the mix, you know, they don't want to hear the, you know, the, your fingers on the guitar strings or anything on this one. You can actually hear Dylan, like kind of breathing in between yeah. times when he's singing. And I, you know, while that can be annoying, <laughs> I also find it to be part of the charm of that album. So highly recommend yeah. it. People can think of that as being low production value, but actually, it's very much part of the production. Gives it it's that that those recordings sort of their fingerprint or their their style, and I, and I and I love that about that. Yeah, me too. Me too. Cool. All right, man. Well, I, we've we've come to the end of another twenty five minutes. Yeah. And uh, that goes fast. It sure does. It sure does. Two fellows who can talk like we can, man. It's <laughs> not easy. <laughs> it's to always talk, a pleasure. <laughs> we'll look forward to talking to you again soon, Ben. All right. Yeah. Yeah, you too, Bill. All right, buddy. Take care and happy trails. Yeah, likewise. So long. Bye-bye. That's a wrap for this episode of Out There with the Birds. Special thanks to our sponsor, the Rita Rendezvous Birding Adventures from Birdwatchers Digest. Your next birding adventure starts at birdwatchersdigest.com backslash RR. Tune in next time for some more birding chatter and bird news that matters with Bill and Ben. Until then, good birding, and we will see you out there with the birds. Bye-bye.